Hi everyone, um, I'm Peter Robinson. I think everyone knows Tom, spot. And um, thank you Spot for proposing this talk. Um, Spot came to me and said, oh, do you want to co-present with me? And I sat there for a full five minutes before I decided whether I would sit in the audience and troll him or stand up on stage and contribute. Yeah, we, we felt it would be for the best if, you know, because if I tried to give this talk, I, I do know most of what I'm talking about here, but it would be the sort of thing where Peter would be like, actually, I changed that last night. <laughs> and uh, so I figured it would be better if he was up on stage to give some of the color. Uh, so I, I wrote some slides. I gave them to Peter, and then he sends me this email on the first night of Flock, and it says, I rewrote all of the slides. I hope that's okay. And we should sit down and talk about it. And then that didn't happen. Uh, and so uh, it's going to be fun for everybody. I didn't rewrite all of them. I just added some sort of more truths. So I really it. don't know what I'm clicking through here. I'm just gonna, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be like uh, uh, PowerPoint karaoke. Uh, all right, so uh, a little bit of history here. Uh, the first Raspberry Pi comes out. It's intended to be a $35 microcomputer uh, to try to teach children how to code. Obviously, it does way more than that now, uh, but that was the original purpose for the design. Um, the pros for this thing, it is super cheap. Uh, it has standard connectors. A lot of the other microcomputers in the space have fun, you know, power or weird serial connectors that you've got to use. You, you end up having like a rat's nest of, do I need this with this board and what do I need for that board? Uh, I have a collection of several microcomputers that all need non-standard cables. Everything on the Pi is relatively standard as far as connections go. And relatively cheap, most importantly. Yes, exactly. Um, a nice thing about it was it was designed to be connected to a television, and thus the outputs are HDMI, and on the original Pi you had the composite video out as well. Uh, you actually still have it on this Pi, it's just through the headphones connector. Yep, so it's sneaky, it's hidden there. Uh, uh, Again, reducing cost, basically. Yes. Uh, the cons, uh, it is an ARMv6 chip in the first Pi uh, because they had that chip lying around at Broadcom and it wasn't really being used very broadly, but they had it and they said, hey, you can use this if you want. So, interesting side point that Evan tells about the original Broadcom chip. He had visions for this chip. Um, it's primarily used in VoIP phones and in set-top boxes and when they were tapping out the silicon. He had a one millimeter by five millimeter spare spot on the chip, and he basically begged his bosses at Broadcom, can I put an arm core in there? Because it was never gonna have an arm core. So basically, one of the main reasons for the V6 was that he could fit it in this spare spot on the silicon, and it basically added a very small amount to the cost of producing this chip. Yep. Unfortunately, because it is an ARMv6 chip, it is slow. And it was slow when it was at the time, but as Peter points out, it was really, the, the point was not to make it fast, it was what was available, what could fit in the space, what was cheap. Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, ARM themselves had already announced, like, anything not, that wasn't ARMv7 was end of life. And so, we'll get to that a few slides down. Yeah. Also, the only networking that was on that original board was Ethernet. Uh, there was no wireless built into it at all. Uh, and there's no real-time clock. There continues to be no real-time clock, but that's a problem you can work around. Come on, there you go. Let's do it. Wakey, wakey. Don't click too many times or you'll end up five slides in. All right. What did you do to the slides? Nothing. Did you put a video in there? No. <laughs> I troll other people's talks, not my own. Uh, that's fair. Just in case any of you who came in late aren't realizing this, we are attempting to give this talk on a Raspberry Pi running Fedora 28. It, it, it's working. Nobody has any plans for dinner, do they? Good news, it's alive. Bad news, LibreOffice does not appear to be. Shall we switch to the, uh, to the laptop at this point? We can if you like. I think that may be a better experience for everyone involved. As much fun as it is watching us try and make the pie work, we're gonna swap it. I don't have that many jokes. <laughs> 
Yeah, so Fedora 18 was the last official um, v5 release. Um, we made a decision about six months prior to the Pi being announced that we were going to move to ARM v7 hard float because ARM themselves had said basically anything that's not ARM v7, i.e. the Cortex series of chips, um, was dead. And at the time we had a handful of Kirkwood boards that were ARM v5 and absolutely no v6 chips uh, devices whatsoever. Um, the other issue was that because the v6 had only ever been focused on phones and primarily even low-end phones, um, ARM themselves had never really invested in like the GCC toolchain and, and things like that. And it basically, while it worked, it had huge amounts of problems and nobody had any interest in fixing them. And so it was primarily actually the state of things like the toolchains and stuff like that for ARM v6 and the fact that there was no chips out there that we made the decision in Fedora that it was going to be ARM v7 hard float and who cares. Um, yeah, and so that was basically it. And, and then, of course, you get, you know, almost overnight, uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, sells out of the store immediately. Everyone is rushing to buy one of these things, and the instant demand for uh, environments for uh, this little $35 microcomputer. So uh, you get some students over in, at Seneca College in, uh, in Canada. Uh, who decided that they would like to run Fedora on the Raspberry Pi. So they went in and did a full rebuild of everything in uh, Fedora. I think it was 18 or 19, one of the two. Um, yeah, the something version. like that. Uh, and then they went and rebuilt it, uh, optimized, uh, optimized isn't the right word, but compiled so that it will actually run on the uh, Raspberry Pi 1. Uh, and then the task was completed, and the students got a grade on that, and then they went off and did different things, and it sat there and bit rotted. Yeah, so they actually did a couple of different Fedora releases. I think the last was about 22. Um, and, but obviously, like, each year a new influx of students would come in. They would be given certain bits of it as a project. Um, and, you know, the teachers would sort of vaguely keep stuff glued together in between classes and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it was primarily um, students. Um, we did get a few very good Fedora contributors from them. Um, there was some controversies around the Pydora name. Um, and, and generally, it was an interesting time. So uh, if, you, if you go on the Raspberry Pi Foundation's website, you will see them recommending Raspbian as the default operating system. They deliver this through a number of channels. Uh, and basically, Raspbian is, uh, is a fork of Debian, straight up, that the Raspberry Pi Foundation put together. And it started as Debian at one point, but it really doesn't resemble uh, Debian in a lot of ways. One of the big changes is that the Raspberry Pi Foundation has their own fork of the Linux kernel, and they use that fork for driving Raspbian entirely. Uh, they also have a whole bunch of firmware uh, inside of it to not only boot the device itself, but also to uh, power up most of the peripherals on the board. Yeah, so they have a number of utilities for controlling the video chip. So the Raspberry Pi or the Broadcom chip is quite different than most chips in that um, you have firmware that's on a fat partition and it's actually the GPU that boots the machine and then the GPU starts up the ARM core and hands over control. But the GPU still keeps control of a lot of the hardware peripherals and so you have this mailbox interface where the Linux kernel actually speaks to the mailbox and says, hey, I need to scale up or down the speed of the CPU. Um, can you adjust these voltages in the GPU so that I can do that? Um, so, you know, if it's running, it, like the Pi 3 is running at 600 megahertz and it needs to go to 1.2 because there's a bunch of stuff happening, it actually has to go and ask the GPU for permission for that. Yeah, and in fact, one of the early libraries that they did was a library in user space that allowed for programs to bypass the operating system almost entirely and talk directly to the GPU to do output. Uh, and so a lot of the early Pi applications were using that library to get high performance uh, 
uh, 1080p video out of the Raspberry Pi because it just sort of said to the operating system, you don't need to know anything about what I'm pushing through over there. Just all this is going over there to get handled. Yeah, I mean, and ultimately that comes back to its history as, as a chip designed primarily for set-top boxes. So, Raspberry Pi 2 comes out. Uh, the big change here is that we get a V7 CPU uh, in the mix. Uh, unfortunately, because of the unique design of the uh, architecture and the hardware, um, you still can't use the upstream kernel for this just because it got a newer CPU. Um, and by this time, like, there were people, you know, sending support for the Raspberry Pi chip upstream. You could actually boot Fedora on it if you wanted serial console and no USB. Um, so it was certainly getting there. There was work being done to get things upstream. Uh, the Pi Foundation had done their first major sort of kernel rebase because they needed a newer kernel for the newer hardware and realised that, oh my God, all the work that we have to do because none of it's upstream. Funny that. Yeah, one of the big... Uh choices that they made uh, was to do things in a, what they thought was a reasonable, sensible way, but was completely different from how everyone else was doing ARM embedded work in the Linux kernel upstream. And so every time they rebased for a while, they had different models for things. Yeah, and I mean, to, to be honest, um, it's still the model for a lot of the ARM SOC vendors that they don't do a lot of stuff upstream. Um, and if you look at most of the ARM vendor kernels, you'll see that they very, very closely align with the versions needed by Android. Um, and Google, with its push to get newer kernels and newer functionality and, and say, and like, if you're running Android P, it has to have at least this kernel, um, is helping drive um, the vendors towards the upstream so that they don't have to do all this extra work for newer versions of Android. So I Uh, so Fedora as a policy has a one kernel policy because we have like three kernel developers um, and basically to support hundreds of thousands of hardware combinations. Um, I do most of the ARM kernel stuff and it's done in the evenings and it's like not my day job basically. Um, and when I first started doing ARM eight years ago, I started poking at kernels because we had problems. Um, and now I know more about kernel code than I ever thought I wanted to know. But it's still a hackathon in the evening and on the weekends sort of thing. Um, there are people that have put the Raspberry Pi kernel source into an RPM and used it in um, Fedora remixes. And the current Raspbian kernel is either 4.9 or 14. Um, and so it does work fine. Um, but basically, Fedora as a project doesn't have enough kernel developers to be able to deal with a thousand different forks of the kernel. Um, so, and also, um, by Fedora doing that, it's amazing how many of the board vendors and that have actually switched to upstream so that they will get Fedora support. And so it's taken us a while, but that sort of, we're not going to have display on the Raspberry Pi. And it was funny because, like, I first tried to get... Um, so on the non-free binary bits, um, the things that we needed in Fedora was the boot firmware. And at the time, like, when it took us about five years and Spot is notionally, like, the Fedora legal person. He cat herds anything to do with legal through the lawyers for the project so that um, tech nerds like me no, don't need to deal with legal nerds. And it took us about five years to work with the Pi Foundation and Broadcom to get them to change the wording because there were distros that were shipping the Pi firmware but the license explicitly said it couldn't be redistributed. And, and so it took us about five years to get, just be able to redistribute the firmware to boot the device. Um, and then around that time, um, we got, the, like, the Pi 2 came out, which was ARM v7, um, and I packaged up the firmware, and it was actually in Fedora for probably two years before we could actually support it. And 
like people that looked at the kernel stuff would see commit messages from me that were like, add support for Broadcom device. And like, I wasn't screaming it, but we officially started to support it in Fedora 25. You could run it in Fedora from about Fedora 22, but it wasn't what I considered minimum viable product, and we'll get to that shortly. Yeah. Um, so the Raspberry Pi has like four major binary blobs. One was the boot firmware. We eventually got that fixed by probably a few lines of change in a text file. Um, the video core, or VC4 as it's generally known, has a binary driver um, and a binary user space that's not Mesa and it's all very proprietary and we could never use that either. And the fact of the matter is most, um, for, like most Raspberry Pi users want the graphical interface. Um, Broadcom, via the Raspberry Pi Foundation, employed a developer to actually develop an open source driver, um, and that's all upstream in Mesa and G uh, in the kernel and things like that. Um, and there was a bunch of other things. Um, there's a bunch of user space libraries for the driver. As Spot mentioned, there's a bunch of user space libraries to be able to speak directly to the video core to do things like 1080p video rendering, um, to speak to the ISP, which is the camera um, sensor processor, um, to get stuff from, from the camera. You can actually speak to the camera sensor and tell it to take this stream of videos and write it straight to the HDMI output. Um, and so it doesn't even hit the Linux kernel and things like that. And so that's why you get a very CPU low powered um, crappy SOC that can actually do like full 1080 video streaming and things like that. And so there was a bunch of that stuff that was binary only and then a bunch of random utilities to poke at various registers um, on it to adjust things like memory, clock speeds, and and various other bits and pieces like that. Yeah, I think the you know speaking of someone that worked with them for a number of years to try to get a lot of this opened up. Uh, initially, there was this intent that they didn't think that anyone was really going to care about any of this code, and that it would be sufficient for them to just be the people who are the experts in that space. But when it was obvious after a couple of years that there were a lot of people that wanted to help improve the situation of the environment and make it maintainable, then they started to open up as much as they possibly could in that space and were really eager to figure out how they could get more eyes into the mix. Uh, I think they really didn't necessarily understood the, uh, the box they had opened when they started working in this uh, technology area. Uh, so pretty much everything except for some of the boot firmware uh, has been put under an open source license and the boot firmware has been relicensed, like Peter said, to uh, allow people to distribute it. Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, if you look at what the Raspberry Pi Foundation wanted to achieve, they're primarily focused um, on education. And so, you know, they wanted to basically make it easier for kids. The fact that they produced this device that was $35 dollars and absolutely changed the single board computer industry with a single announcement um, was extraordinary. Um, but like if you speak to most of the people at the organisation, it was about kids getting hold of devices to code and you know, like you look at kids' faces when they first get to light up an LED and it's like, you know, you can fully understand why. But as far as they were concerned, the actual device itself was more a tool to, or an enabling tool to enable that. So they're not so much focused on things like open source. If they have a kernel that works and that they can support, and 90, and like one of the biggest problems we have with the open VC4 driver versus the closed driver is that the amount of monitors that it just goes black on because it can't negotiate the EDID and work out what's there um, has caused, and it's improved a huge amount, I'll get to that shortly. Um, but yeah, it, it's an interesting problem. So uh, they continue to iterate the hardware. We have the Raspberry Pi 3 and the 3 Plus. Uh, the hardware now uh, has an ARCH64 uh, core inside of it. Uh, it's ARM v7 compatible. Uh, we do have ARCH64 builds for the Pi, yeah. but... but but what? Should people use this? Well, I mean, ARM64 on the Raspberry Pi is interesting. Um, 
the image that I promote primarily is the ARM v7 one because you can have one SD card and you can put it in the 2, the 3 and the 3 plus and it will automatically detect everything and just boot. Um, it's only got a gig of memory and the problem with the 64-bit address space is you actually end up on low um, resource machines end up wasting a lot of that memory. Um, so depending on what you want to do with it, you're much better with the 32-bit version. Um, a lot of people on the Pi want to run things like Kubernetes and other such things that, and basically stuff that really needs 64-bit. Um, so a lot of people use it in the server space with 64-bit, but if people just want a desktop to, you know, browse around and, you know, blink LEDs and things like that, um, I always recommend the 32-bit one because it's just a little bit faster. Yeah, exactly. The performance difference is noticeable between the AR64 build and the ARM v7 build. And um, when Spot did the slides, he said more USB, also more reliable USB. All lies. I may have put that in there to troll Peter, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, like, when they went from the V6 to the quad-core V7, from the quad-core V7 to the quad-core V8, all the peripherals and everything changed, uh, stayed the same, and they were just swapping out bits of silicon. Um, and the USB controller is terrible. And if you look at most ARM SOCs, you'll have, you know, five or six MMC, you know, half a dozen serial, um, you know, a couple of CAN, a real-time clock or two, um, half a dozen USB root ports, and various other bits and pieces. Um, the Raspberry Pi has one buggy USB bit of silicon, um, which basically with the upstream kernel runs half duplex, and so your 480 megabits is much closer to 240 megabits. Um, in reality, I think we can um, push a little bit more than that. Um, the way the Pi Foundation deals with that, and basically it doesn't have um, a bit of hardware silicon in there, so it has to be that v bit of the USB stack, which is normally done in hardware, is emulated in software in the kernel. The way the Pi Foundation works around that to get a bit more speed is they use the FIQ, when that patch was proposed upstream, basically the USB stack maintainer and a whole bunch of the other people like fell off their chairs laughing and went, no, not ever, not over my dead body. So the Pi Foundation's kernel has this terrible hack to make it go faster um, because, you know, cheap. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have a lot of other things that a standard ARM board has. It doesn't have a JIC, which is a global interrupt controller, and various other bits and pieces, which makes the performance um, compared to, you know, a similar ARM SOC substandard. Yeah, I, I, there's an entire chapter in my uh, O'Reilly Raspberry Pi book on why your USB devices aren't working properly in the Raspberry Pi. It has gotten slightly better in that regard because we've been able to do some clever workarounds to, to see devices when they're plugged in as before where you would have a device plugged in and the Pi might just turn off or refuse to see the device at all. Uh, but uh, it's, it's still unreliable and so uh, one of the things I tell people when they're trying to build kit based on the Raspberry Pi is that if they can figure out some way to wire it directly into the GPIO they're going to have a much better experience than if they try to go through the USB port. Well and, and USB devices draw power and one of the, probably the number one biggest support problem we see in Fedora is that the power supply is not rated enough. Yeah, which was actually the problem we were having from 8.15 to 8.45 this morning. Yeah, so I, I mentioned, we've mentioned the um, boot firmware, um, there's the open source VC4 driver, so we have fully accelerated um, Mesa, so GNOME will run with Wayland fully accelerated. Um, it's still not exactly fast. Um, there's um, still a whole bunch of kernel changes not upstream. Um, there's no camera driver, there's no um, video acceleration offload drivers, um, and there's no support for the official Raspberry Pi touchscreen yet. Um, and, like, there's a bunch of that stuff in motion, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, the Pi Foundation is now actually looking, and it's 
um, at moving from their closed source driver to the upstream open driver in Raspbian as well. I believe the latest release that just happened to support the 3 plus actually has it there and people can enable it, but it's not there by default. Um, amusingly, um, so about a year ago, like, the Fedora project hadn't had a lot of communication with the Pi Foundation because of something happened in the early years of um, the existence of that device. Um, and finally last year, um, I got connected with Eben and I went up there and um, we actually had a very fun face-to-face -face meeting. I demoed, I think it was Fedora 26, running ARM64, GNOME shell, fully open stack on the Raspberry Pi. That was with grub menus and everything. And Evan was blown away. It was the first time he'd ever seen his device running a fully open source stack. Um, and that was kind of cool. And so um, we've had, you know, and the Pi Foundation hosted back in May a um, GNOME Performance Hack Fest. So in Fedora 29, there's going to be a bunch of changes that are landing into GNOME, which help, should help speed things up and give more memory um, and make it generally better for Raspberry Pi and other low resource devices. Um, so, so that's kind of cool. And, and um, yeah, and so there's still some closed binaries um, and, you know, bits and pieces, but we're certainly getting there. Most notably, we can't ship the firmware for the wireless or the Bluetooth controllers because Broadcom. Yeah, so the wireless is interesting. We actually do ship the firmware. We ship some of it. Um, what we don't <laughs> ship is the NVRAM. And the interesting, well, most wireless firmware has some form of NVRAM in something like a $2,000 laptop. You know, they have an onboard chip that has that. Um, so, and in a lot of the Broadcom cases, um, the firmware configuration file, the NVRAM, um, is actually shoved into vendor-specific ACPI tables. And so, the Broadcom driver will read from, a, try to write for, find and read from an EEPROM, and then it will fall back to BIOS tables, and finally it looks for a text file that it's expecting to be there. Um, Broadcom a couple of years ago sold all their wireless stack off to Cyprus. Um, I spoke to the Pi Foundation a year ago and we've had follow-up emails about it and it's not just the Pi that has an issue here but a number of low-end tablets and a huge amount of other ARM SBCs. Um, and so the Pi Foundation escalated it to Broadcom Cyprus and there is now a, combination, uh, a conversation happening uh, between the Pi Foundation's lawyers, Cyprus lawyers, and Broadcom lawyers. Uh, so I don't ever expect to get that resolved. Um, and we're looking, like, the Pi Foundation is actively working um, to look at whether they can just license it themselves, because it is Pi specific. Um, and, you know, there are, is other discussions going on upstream for other devices as well. Um, we're hoping we'll get there. Um, the Bluetooth firmware, the firmware will actually run with the built-in default firmware. It has issues and it's not particularly stable. Um, I'm hoping we should be able to get the, the firmware for that into the upstream kernel real soon now. So again, um, there's stuff like that that's happening um, and there's a bunch of other drivers and improvements that are happening. Um, of course, it just never happens as fast as everyone would like. Yeah, so the only thing I wanted to mention for here, I mentioned minimum viable product. Um, a lot of the ARM devices we support, um, you know, a USB, SD card slot, maybe SATA, and serial console. In a lot of cases, the display doesn't work and things like that. And we enable them because, you know, the people that tend to use those devices are a lot more um, computer savvy and, and know what a USB TTL is and things like that. When it came to the Raspberry Pi, there was no way in hell I was going to announce that we had Raspberry Pi support if they couldn't plug in a keyboard and a mouse um, and basically get output like this and a graphical display and various other bits and pieces. Um, so just 
and like the Fedora ARM team is relatively small, and so I didn't want to get into a situation where we had a million users download and try and use their Raspberry Pi, and I said, oh, you have to go and spend another three, four bucks and get a USB TTL. Um, so when I added Pi support, I had, we have to have a minimum viable product. We have to have HDMI output. We have to have USB keyboard mouse. We have to be able to get XFCE or something like that up and running um, so that, you know, the user will plug in what they expect. And so Fedora 25 was when we landed what I considered the minimum viable product. One SD card, you could plug it, plug it into a Pi 2 or a Pi 3, it would automatically boot up and like literally you can just DD it out on Windows, it is the one device that the SD card for all our images is set up to boot on. Um, and so you can literally DD it out, plug it in, boot it up and you'll get to a login prompt. So, so that's why, Fedora, like, as I mentioned, we had support there since about Fedora 22, but it wasn't what I considered a minimal viable product for the average um, Raspberry Pi user. Um, I don't think we need to go into huge amounts of detail. Um, we use U-Boot on top of the Pi firmware. Um, Raspberry and boots the kernel directly, um, but... U-Boot gives us the ability to boot m multiple kernels. Um, in the ARC64, you actually get, it boots then Grub via UEFI and you get the standard Grub menu. In Fedora 25, uh, ugh, too many numbers. Um, in Fedora 29, um, v 7 will also have Grub. So in both um, 32 and 64-bit ARM, um, you'll get exactly the same experience as you get on your Intel laptop. Um, yeah, so, like, and obviously once we had a minimum viable product, um, we sort of extended stuff, you know, Wi-Fi support, HDMI audio, um, video that was more stable. The problems we had with black screens from 25 to 26 was an order of magnitude lower. Um, we've gone into Y ARM64 support. Um, the... Raspberry Pi 3 Plus um, was an interesting turning point. I mentioned last year I had um, a meeting with Eben and the Pi Foundation. Um, we had support in Fedora 28 GA for the Raspberry Pi 3 Plus. I actually got an email from Eben um, about a month before the 3 Plus was announced and basically just saying, what's your shipping address? and a 3 Plus arrived in the mail about a month before. And so we had an opportunity to bootstrap this and get firmwares and various other bits and pieces into place so that when it was announced, um, and we missed getting, I think, one bit needed into, like, the beta freeze by, I think, about 12 hours. Um, so beta didn't actually have support for the 3 Plus, but the nightly soon after, right after when we unfroze did. And so that was incredible and actually quite cool because like when F28 came out, there was people going, when's the 3 Plus going to be supported? It already is. So that, that was fantastic. So the future. Um, one of the biggest problems and one of the biggest support issues we have, um, and it's not just Fedora, but it is uh, distributions that aren't Raspbian have, is that people go, oh, I've enabled this hat in the config.txt file and it doesn't work. Oh, we don't support it like that. Well, in Fedora 29, and I need to do some testing and, and, and we've got a few bits to sort out, but in Fedora 29, the vast majority of config.txt should work just like it does in Raspbian. Some of it does now. Um, it won't all, like, so any of the stuff that's around the VC4 driver versus the closed driver won't work. But for the vast majority of cases, the config text files, and that's fantastic, because the Pi Foundation and the entire ecosystem around the Raspberry Pi has all this documentation where they say, enable this in the config.txt. So Fedora, Susie, all the other distros, um, have been working with the Pi Foundation to ensure that this happens. Um, so it enables us to much more easily support hats and cameras and 
um, various things, um, but it brings us much closer to um, Raspbian. And so we don't have to go here, we're the exception, not the norm. Um, and so um, we've got some stuff I need to deal with around U-Boot, and I'm hoping that that should be in place um, in time for beta. Um, camera, um, there is a whole bunch of patch series um, that have been posted that should make the camera work. Um, a part of that is waiting for me to test, um, and part of that is getting the config.tech stuff working. <laughs> um, but things around um, the camera have had, they've had to, like the person getting this driver upstream has had to have changes in the core v for Linux stack. Um, and people have said, oh, why don't you just write the support? Well, one, I'm not a kernel developer of that note. Um, two, you need Broadcom NDAs for hardware docs and various other bits and pieces. Um, it probably, the camera support in particular, probably won't land in F29 GA, but I'm hoping, um, and we'll probably have a 419 kernel as a zero day update or fairly close. Um, and I'm looking at Laura and she's not screaming at me, so I'm pretty sure I'm not completely wrong there. Um, and so I'm hoping very early in the F29 cycle we should be able to use the camera. Um, my brothers will be very happy because they want to use it on the farm. <laughs> um, official touch screen. Um, it needs two bits. It has the actual touch interface. Um, the driver for that's not quite upstream yet. And it needs support for the DSi interface. Most of that is upstream, but it needs a bunch of glue. Um, also probably needs config.txt support. <laughs> um, but again, um, hopefully getting that in F29. Um, I know Bex and the ambassadors with the f Federator will be very happy about that. I have one of those sitting on my desk at home. Um, and then beyond. Um, once we get the config.txt support, it enables us to enable hats. Um, and there's a vast array of hats in the ecosystem. There's lots of people that want to use Fedora on their Raspberry Pis for various audio stuff with the various audio file hats that you can put on top. Um, I'm sure you could probably get a $100 audio file Ethernet cable for your Raspberry Pi. Um, and so that's official touchscreen and official camera support is something that I get um, almost more queries about than I did. So in the five years it took us to support the Raspberry Pi, I think I averaged probably, you know, one query a day as to when it was going to be supported. Uh, when the Pi 2 came out, that went up to probably, you know, 10 queries an hour level. Um, the touchscreen and the camera support aren't that quite that. Um, obviously, hat support, a lot of people want support for things like the Sense hat. Um, and, and then basically just stuff in the ecosystem. Um, Part of the issue there is that a lot of the hat support has involved device tree overlays. Uh, and the device tree overlays that exist for the uh, upstream Raspberry Pi Foundation kernel are good reference points for porting to the upstream model, but they can't be dropped in place. They're not going to be able to work as is. So there is some porting. Some of them just will never be portable but most of them can be fixed and applied. Uh, I've done some basic work uh, in theory to get this ready to go when the config uh, uh, file pass through actually works. Uh, so I, it's totally doable and I imagine that a lot of the hats will very quickly get uh, proper upstream support. Well, and, and like s some of the hats will be the same and just work and again, we've done a bunch of work with the Pi Foundation um, as to how that works um, and I mean, ultimately, now they're more focused on getting things like the open VC4 driver working and things like that. All the work that we've done in Fedora actually ends up being a really good enabler for them. And, like, we've belted out a huge amount of issues with the VC4 and the EDID detection stuff that they now don't need to do. Um, so they're not starting from the ground zero like we were. Um, it w was very amusing to me when F Fedora 25 landed where, you know, we have a five-year-old device and Fedora as a very old distribution and I was having um, sort of early adopter 
problems with such a device that was five years old. Um, <laughs> I get all the luck. Um, and, you know, some of the other stuff is like the GPIO stuff um, that the Pi Foundation uses is an end-of-life deprecated interface in the kernel that basically um, is extremely insecure. Um, so funnily enough, we've turned that off in the Fedora kernel because it's deprecated and I never want to support it. But the Python GPIO bindings, um, if you run them on Fedora, it says, this is not a Raspberry Pi, go away. <laughs> um, and so there's a new library, libgpio, um, and what I'm... And it's almost stable enough... Well, it's relatively stable. We now have in F29 Python bindings. And what I'm hoping is that the rpi.gpio Python bindings, um, we can get upstream to accept some patches where it will use that interface. And if that interface is not available, it will fall back to the old interface. And people are like... Like, I've spoken to people about it, and they're like, oh, it'll be just easier to copy it and have, you know, a clone of it. And it's like, no, that's not going to work, because there is literally 10,000 how-to guides out there that say, pip install this library. And a bit similar to the config.txt stuff, all the documentation says it. So it's like, if you're Raspberry and do this, if you're Fedora, do that. For, you know, a 10-year-old working off a worksheet in a lab, that's not going to work. So, you know, we need to get support into the upstream. And, like, I explain that to people and they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Because ultimately we're not going to be able to go out to every, like, how-to guide and get them to add, if Raspberry and do this, else, you know, do this. And so stuff like that that people don't necessarily understand, oh, it's just going to be quicker to recreate it. No, it's not. Um, and so it's things like that that I'm hoping we'll get um, support for. So even though it is Fedora, all the documentation out there, all the classroom guides and things like that will work just as if it was Raspbian. We're not there yet, but this is what I'm looking to do. And if anyone's any good at writing Python bindings um, or things like that and want to get involved in that sort of stuff, come and let me know. Do we have any questions? Um, so the question is, when is camera support going I to be available? I believe he's trolling us. I yes. know. Oh, Fedora 25, go back in time. <laughs> uh, we'll watch the video afterwards. You can see where I talked about it about 10 minutes ago. No one? So the question is, even though the talk's about Raspberry Pi, what is the best ARM device to use on Fedora? Um, my, a my answer to that is always another question. The question is, what are you going to do with it? And, and we support, without exaggeration, 200 plus devices on Fedora ARM, 32 and 64 bit. Um, if w what you want to do is like turn LEDs on and off and maybe run some Bluetooth house stuff, you know, the Pi is a perfectly fine device. Um, you know, if you want to do AI and machine learning, the Pi is not the device for that. It just doesn't have the power. Um, if you want to run a NAS box, you know, the Pi is not that, even though hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people do. Um, you know, the Orange Pi series have four USB controllers on board that run at 480 megabits a second. Um, and have proper SOC attached gigabit Ethernet as opposed to uh, US like 100 meg or in the case of the 3 plus gigabit Ethernet that runs at around 300 meg if you're running Raspbian. Um, so it basically depends on what you want. Like, you know, we have a bunch of, like the Jetson devices run GNOME desktop fully accelerated and really, really well. The IMX6 stuff along with the Pi and the Dragonboard 410 will all run fully accelerated Wayland. 
Um, so, you know, they're all not bad, but, you know, a gig of RAM's just really not enough. Um, what we land, there was a patch that landed in GDM the other day, which will literally reduce um, the shell utilization um, by 230 odd meg, um, which, you know, when it comes to the Pi is 25, you know, 23% of your memory utilization. Um, there's some patches going into package kit, various other bits and pieces. And again, that'll improve utilization across all the ARM ecosystem. And even, even the cheap low-end x86 stuff as well. Um, so yeah, it very much depends on what you want to do. And how much you want to spend. Exactly. Till. Um, the question is, is there anything better on Fedora than Raspbian for the Raspberry Pi? Everything. Even the things that don't work aren't better because it's Fedora. Uh, um, the feedback I generally get from the people that use Fedora on the Raspberry Pi is that we have things like Kubernetes and Docker and a lot of the server ecosystem where it just works. People like the fact that because we're using the upstream Fedora kernel, they can boot up their Raspberry Pi and it's running SE Linux, just like their x86 desktop. Um, you know, they can use the server edition and cockpit is there and they can, you know. And so I think probably, like, if you want to use hats and blink, you know, LEDs and that sort of stuff, Raspbian at the moment is by far the improved thing because they're focusing on that device. Like if you try and use Raspbian on other devices, it'll work, but you'll have a substandard experience. Um, so any of the server-side stuff, cloud stuff, Docker, various other bits and pieces works. Um, because it's Fedora, we have the latest and greatest, um, you know, libraries and optimizations and Mesa and stuff like that. Um, two years ago, I went to my first Lenaro Connect. Lenaro, f for those that don't know, is a bit like OpenStack Foundation for the ARM ecosystem. It's a um, organisation where ARM SOC manufacturers and all of that congregate to talk about the ARM ecosystem or open source in the ARM ecosystem. And I ran into a vast array of kernel developers that had been. Um, I'd been dealing with upstream for support for everything from the Pi through to whatever. And they were like, holy God, you're actually here? Because, like, the ARM SOC kernel maintainer had been asking me for five years when I was coming. Um, and they just said, the thing we love about Fedora, all the latest packages, stable, it works exactly the way Fedora does on my laptop. And they were all like, even the kernel where we boot our device and we have serial console, USB, Ethernet and storage um, is great. And they leave the default Fedora in kernel in place, even though they're kernel developers, so that when they blow up their kernel and the device ceases to boot, they can just select Fedora from the menu, or the Fedora kernel from the menu, and they can get back up and running again. Um, I've spent vast array of time looking through all the libraries to make sure we have all the ARM optimizations in place and everything else. And so the feedback I get from a lot of people is that SE Linux just works. Um, and, you know, there were some patches that I work with upstream for where we literally tripled the throughput, I think, between Fedora 25 and 26 of the MMC stuff. So, like, we're not even the fastest, but we're certainly getting there. Um, but the general thing is that it's like Fedora and they can, like I see blog posts, oh, how to build Kubernetes on your Raspberry Pi. And I reply to them, or you can just run Fedora and go DNF install Kubernetes. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people do. Yeah, I think the consistency is a big part of that. I think, you know, being able to get this exact same Fedora experience no matter what hardware you're running on is a really valuable selling point for why you would consider doing that. And, like, I hope that we can get to a place where, you know, Fedora is a, a reasonable choice to use it in the classroom for all these things. Um, you know, I do support for the Raspberry Pi primarily 
in my own time. Like, I have a love-hate relationship with the Raspberry Pi. I generally actually refer to it as the Raspberry fucking Pi because it's caused me so much stress. But at the same time, it's a huge ecosystem. And um, I want to get all the stuff working, camera, display, and, and everything, so it is all just plug and play, like uh, Raspbian... Um, if you could clone me three or four times or someone would like to come along and help out with the Python bindings for GPIO and things like that. You know, it's just a small project that people can work on an hour here and an hour there, but it will greatly help the Fedora ecosystem and, in fact, the Linux ecosystem in general on the Raspberry Pi um, and help expand it. And, you know... I have semi-regular conversations, sometimes with Spot, sometimes with things, how we can get Fedora better supported so that it can be used in classrooms on the Raspberry Pi. There is a lot of interest in doing so. And we are well over our time slot, so thank you all for coming out. Thank you.